today we'll be discussing the third aspect of the creative process. Uh, to begin, I hope everybody did uh, okay on their projects and survived and made it through without too much stress and anxiety. The whole purpose of the role model projects is to get you energized, not to zap you of energy. So hopefully you'll spend the next few days, right? We have until Sunday evening to watch all of your classmates' presentations and then to comment on them. In order to leave behind the ordinary world, right, we answer the call, and that often requires us to be courageous and to find some ways to, to get motivated to overcome all of the pessimistic thoughts and negative thoughts that fill our heads, right, when we think about venturing out to someplace unknown. But even once we do that, once we have the courage to venture out, there's often something keeping us back from fully exploring. So you have this exercise that's supposed to represent Picasso's idea of the creative process. He says, every act of creation is first of all an act of destruction. So as we talked about in the previous lecture, that refers to how we need to let go of the ordinary world. We have to break the bonds or the ties that keep us there, right? We can have courage, we can have uh, motivation to leave it behind, but unless we literally cut the ties, destroy some of our ordinary world beliefs and views, etc., then it's kind of hard to leave the ordinary world behind. So hopefully you realize that in order to create something different, the first thing you might want to do is just to describe your ordinary world to yourself, because what often makes it hard for us to cut those ties is that we don't even know we're being tied down. So outlining, describing all the beliefs and habits of behavior that define your ordinary world of whatever it might be, if you define it first, well, then it's much easier to go, okay, I have to let this go, let that go, destroy that belief, destroy that habit, destroy that approach. And then it's much easier to you know, leave your you know, normal view of something. And hopefully you saw that with the flower exercise. So what we said at the end of last lecture was that this requires cognitive flexibility, right? So cognitive flexibility refers to our ability to change perspectives, to change and shift viewpoints. So what makes this difficult for us to do? Well, first is brain wiring, right? The way our brain is structured makes it kind of hard for us to leave behind the ordinary world. And then two is social conformity. So for mammals especially, and for a lot of other creatures, you know, we're kind of born to be socially, to have social bonds. So obviously then trying to do something different, trying to leave behind the ordinary world in some sense means leaving some of those social bonds behind, right? Okay, so let's talk about brain wiring first. By the way, if you have questions as I continue, feel free to chime in with your mic. Um, there's no, no problem there. So brain wiring. So we learn in class that our brains are made up of brain cells called neurons, right? And all these neurons are connected to one another. And as we live through our lives, certain connections and patterns of activation of those neurons get kind of ingrained in us. Right? This is what learning is. Right? Learning is about being exposed to certain ideas and certain behaviors. And then eventually, the connections between the neurons that are needed for those behaviors, the connections between the neurons that are needed to come to that understanding of a concept, well, they get ingrained, right? which makes it easy for us to do something. It makes it easy for us to remember an idea or a concept. So this is heavy in learning. But obviously, the more that you're exposed to the same sort of thing and you think about the same way, the more that you're exposed to a certain type of problem and approach that problem the same way, well, the more ingrained those connections are, which makes it harder for us to rewire ourselves, to see things differently, to understand uh, an idea differently, right? The second problem is that human beings, we have this natural propensity towards homeostasis. So hopefully you remember from your readings that homeostasis you know, refers to this idea that we kind of like to be in a equilibrium state. We like to be in an environment that our bodies are accustomed to, which means we have a drive towards familiarity. 
just like we talked about with the negativity bias, you don't want the, your, bio, your body biologically doesn't want it to be in a world that's chaotic, right? Because then it doesn't know where the food is coming from. It doesn't know where the predators are. It wants to be in a very stable world. It wants to be in a very familiar world. All right, food is over there, so I can rely on that when I'm hungry. Predators over there, so I don't have to worry about them approaching me from a different direction, right? So we have this drive towards familiarity. Well, if we have a drive towards what's familiar, then just like we talked about with helping learning, we're going to be exposing ourselves to the same ideas, the same ways of looking at things, the same approaches to problems. So for your first homework assignment, was it your first? Where I asked you to describe the ordinary world of one of your five-year goals, right? The idea was to become very aware of what those pre-existing networks were. If you have a goal of, let's say, losing weight, well, what is your ordinary world of losing weight? What's the normal approach you have or other people have to it? What is the typical ideas of what it entails to lose weight? You know, maybe eating less, exercising more, right? So you define the ordinary world of it, and then the hope is that we can somehow let that go. But because of these things, heavy and learning and homeostasis, it's hard to do that. Okay, so how can we do that then? Well, there's some hope. There's some hope of leading the ordinary world behind, and we're talking about two different things concerning the brain that gives us hope, right? The first is the hemisphere functionality of the brain, right? So we have two different and in many ways separate hemispheres, right? So we look at the brain, we can split up into two major components and there's, there's really a, one major freeway that connects both that allows the two hemispheres to communicate. And they do lots of similar functions, but there's also very distinct functionality between them. You know, this has been a study of a lot of research. You know, what's the difference between two hemispheres? And as somebody mentioned earlier, there's this idea that one hemisphere is like the creative brain and the other hemisphere is the more analytical brain. Have you heard of this, have this idea? Uh, a lot of that stems from certain studies that we'll talk about in a second, right? So my question to you, as we go through these studies, think about why would people interpret these studies as meaning one hemisphere is creative, the other hemisphere is more logical, okay? So as we go through the studies, ask yourself, okay, what, why do people believe that as a result of these studies? Okay, so here we go, let's take a look. So here is a study done with a group of people with right hemisphere damage, okay? So remember right hemisphere, right hemisphere damage. They showed them this image of a semicircle on the far left, and they said, okay, can you memorize that? They said, sure. Can you memorize also this image of, the, of a, another semicircle? And they said, sure. And then they asked them, okay, in your mind's eye, can you put the two images together and envision a full circle? People with right hemisphere damage had trouble doing that. They could envision the image on the far left Right? They can envision the image in the center, but when you ask them in their mind's eye, could you put the two together and envision them making a full circle, they had trouble. So think about what that might mean for what that right hemisphere does for us. Okay, next study. They asked, again, people with right hemisphere damage to take a look at a room and then try to memorize what the room looks like from your particular point of view. And they go, okay, I got it. And then they asked them to turn around. Okay, they turned around and they said to the patients, can you, can you try to memorize what this other side of the room looks like? And they said, okay, I got it. And then they asked, in your mind's eye, can you envision what the entire room looks like? People with right hemisphere damage had trouble doing that, had trouble putting the two images in their head to imagine what the whole room looks like. Okay, what might that mean for the right hemisphere? In one study, again done with people with right hemisphere damage, they were asked, what's an appropriate response to this question? Okay, so they asked the people with the damage to the right hemisphere. What's the appropriate, what's a, an appropriate response to this question? Can you pass the salt shaker? 
Many of the, those people with right hemisphere damage said an appropriate response would be, yes, I can. What's odd about that response? What is, what is peculiar about that response? You would just pass the salt shaker. What's that? You would just pass the salt shaker. Well, if you were at lunch with a friend, right, and, and you asked them, hey, can you pass the salt shaker, an appropriate response, like you mentioned, is for them to give it to you, <laughs> right? Is for them to actually give you the salt shaker. If your friend said, yes, I can, <laughs> They're, they're, they're messing with you. You think they're just playing around with you and you like maybe punch them in the shoulder or something, right? But what, what does this say about people with the right hemisphere damage? Okay, next example. When asked which of the following two images best represent what it means to have a heavy heart, Which of these two images do you think the people with the right hemisphere damage pointed to most often? The one on the left or the one on the right? Yeah. You're getting the picture, right? They pointed most often to the one on the left, having a heavy heart. Okay, so I see some very good responses here from, from you guys. Good that you've been reading. <laughs> or maybe your intuition is just right on the money here. Yeah, they would pick the one on the left. Okay, last example. They, um, they gave um, these people with the right hemisphere damage in the study um, a joke, okay? So I, I don't remember if this is the joke that's in the textbook. So if it is, you know, sorry to have you uh, read about it or listen to it again. So here's an example of a joke, right? Uh, so there's a, a family that's about ready to go to Disneyland for vacation, summer vacation, right? It's like July, school's out. So the dad packs up the van, loads the kids, right? And then they head down Highway 5 to head towards Anaheim. Uh, I guess this is pre-COVID. Uh, the father pulls off the freeway at Anaheim, right at the exit where Disneyland's supposed to be. And then as he pulls off the freeway, he sees a sign that says Disneyland left. So he turns around and goes back home. Okay, so people with right hemisphere damage had difficulty understanding the joke, right? Now, why would they have difficulty understanding the joke? Well, the idea is that to understand a joke, and especially one like this where there's a punchline, Disneyland left, you have to understand that there's multiple meanings of the word left, right? One meaning is that Disneyland is to the left, so turn left, and the other meaning is Disneyland went bye-bye. So people with the right hemisphere damage had difficulty accessing the alternative meaning. Now, if you didn't laugh or get the joke, don't freak out. Don't think you have brain damage, okay? <laughs> Can you see what the right hemisphere might do for us? How might you summarize this based upon these studies? So I saw Youssef says, don't understand sarcasm in figurative language. So it feels as if the left hemisphere is not good at understanding sarcasm, not good at understanding figurative language, but the right hemisphere is, right? What else? What else can you say? Difficulty in putting things together. So maybe the right hemisphere is responsible putting things together, right? What else can you say about the right hemisphere? We take things too literally, right? So maybe the left hemisphere is very good at being literal, but the right hemisphere is good at deeper senses of meaning. Jason, less imaginative, right? Exploring connotations, good. So can you get a sense for why people believe or say things like the right brain, the right hemisphere is the creative brain, and the left hemisphere is the logical analytical brain. Right? So when these studies first came out, this is why that sort of stereotype came to be. And I'll talk about why that's a stereotype in a second. But let's just jot down some of these ideas, right? So the left hemisphere 
as we mentioned, is seemingly the literal hemisphere. And it's the hemisphere that is used to working when we're being exposed to something we've already been exposed to. So if you learn a language, and by the way, all of these references to right and left hemispheres are done with patients who are mainly right-handed. So this very clear distinction is not necessarily the case for those that are left-handed. So for those that had, a, if you're using the left hemisphere, you'll see that it's the one that's triggered most often when you're seeing something you've seen before, right? It's the, it's the hemisphere that jumps to an initial understanding of something. It's the one that works and is active when you're doing something you're used to doing. What does that sound like? In our language from class, what does our left ordinary world, right? So our left hemisphere is what's really active when we are older because we've learned things and we think we know things. The right hemisphere is the hemisphere that's responsible seemingly for accessing multiple meanings, for processing new things, right? But you know, as you get older learning, you become more efficient at acting in the world and behaving in the world. So we use the left, left hemisphere more often. When you're younger and you're a kid and you're trying to learn something for the first time like a language, we see the right hemisphere being very active. And then as you start to learn that language, it seemingly shifts so that information of the language is much more active in the left. But notice that we actually do have a hemisphere that's there to help us access more meaning. We have a hemisphere that's there to help us process things in new ways. So while the left hemisphere is dominant as we get older, we still have that part of ourselves that can let the ordinary world go. We have part of us that's still here, I mean, unless you have some sort of surgery where you remove the right hemisphere, we have that part of us that are, that's still here that helps us to explore new ideas, new perspectives, to destroy, at least temporarily, the ordinary world, right? The second thing that gives us hope for overcoming our brain wiring is neuroplasticity. And that's our brain's ability to change and adapt and rewire every time we experience something new. And in the text, some of the examples of this include, you know, stroke victims. When you have a stroke, what do they do for you? Well, you go into therapy. The idea isn't that when you have a stroke, that's it for your, your brain cells and those connections and for your functionality. I mean, the before, we used to think when you have a stroke and you lose your speech, you lose your ability to walk, then, you know, that's, that's it. You can't improve upon that. But eventually we, we learned that, no, 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 you can actually help stroke victims go through therapy to better their speech, to get more functionality of their muscles and their body. So you can actually retrain your brain. You can rewire your brain so that it adapts in new ways to function in the world, right? The other uh, study that was mentioned in the text was uh, one done with people that were asked to learn a new skill. So a bunch of volunteers came in, they did some brain scans on the volunteers, and then they let them go saying, we want you to practice juggling. Okay, so then the volunteers would practice juggling for a few months, and they were brought back in, and new scans were taken of their brains. They noticed that there was changes, you know, very marketable changes in the brains that seemed to indicate rewiring was happening. New connections were being made as a result of them experiencing, you know, juggling, as a result of them practicing juggling. And if you've ever developed a skill, you know this, right? Playing piano, writing, speaking new language, you learn and you, you're, you, you, you can change yourself as a result of practice and rehearsal and study. So our brains are adaptable, right? So seemingly then we can access that creative part. By the way, let's go back to that stereotype. The reason why I say it's a stereotype to think of the brain as you know, one being creative and the other not is because you can have access to lots of meaning and lots of ideas, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna create something, right? Being creative means you manifest something, right? It means you actually create something. And what does that require? Well, that requires you take your ideas, your creative insight, and you use skills, right? You use knowledge to make it happen. So you might have a lot of ideas for a business, 
which may come from, you know, right brain activity. But unless you use knowledge of businesses and how to establish uh, a balance sheet and, uh, you know, all the skills you learn in your accounting classes, well, it's going to be hard to manifest it. So you need both hemispheres. You need the functionality that is seen in both hemispheres to be creative. I'm hoping you write that down and underline it and, and highlight that, right? You need, you need both, okay? So then what it seems like we can do is we can practice. We can exercise our brain so that we're not so attached to the functionality of the left. This is kind of what we mean by, by cognitive flexibility. We can practice accessing multiple meanings. We can practice letting go of the ordinary world. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that now together. Um, we're going to go through various images and puzzles, and I want you to get a sense for what it feels like to leave the ordinary world behind, to cut the ties we have with our ingrained beliefs and ideas and perceptions. Okay? So let's take a look at this image. Um, how many of you can see a silhouette of two faces? Go ahead and type in yes. Okay, and those are in blue if you can't. How many of you can see the uh, image of like a vase or a candle holder in the center of the screen? Say yes for that. Okay. So notice that you can shift perspective, right? You can shift, if you stare at the image, you can shift from focusing on the faces or focusing on the vase. I mean, that's something you are doing. You're letting go of one perception in order to access a different one. So oftentimes, one perception is going to be more dominant than the other. Which hemisphere is that going to come from? Left, right? So whatever you see first. If you saw the faces first, then that was the most common perception for you. So that's most likely what we say is the ordinary world left hemisphere perception. And then when you let that go to experience the other interpretation, well, then you're accessing your ability, your right hemisphere's ability to uh, access multiple meanings. Okay, so you literally let go of the ordinary world. Let's take a look at another example. Okay, how many of you see the bunny rabbit first? How many of you see the duck first? Write down the name of the animal you saw first. Wow, a lot of us see the, the rabbit first, huh? Okay, so if this is new to you and you can't see one or the other, let's talk about it. So the bunny rabbit is looking to the right of your screen. So it's looking at the words letting go of the ordinary world, staring at that with its nose and its mouth and then its ears are pointed behind it right so the rabbit is staring to the right of your screen with its ears and i'm not too sure if this is mirrored on your screen hopefully it's not mirrored and then the ears are pointing towards um behind it right for those that see the duck first the duck beak is to the left of your screen and it's looking in that direction okay so whatever you saw first, we say ordinary world, and then you let that go, and then you're able to access the other perception, then you're able to exercise your right hemisphere, okay? Okay, how many of you see the cube here? Go ahead and type in yes. Everybody should. This is not the hard part. <laughs> okay, so we got that. How many of you see the cube here? Okay, good. Okay, let me know if this is what you see. Okay, I'm going to try to describe what I think you are seeing. To you, what I think you might be seeing is like a white cube that's in front of a bunch of black dots, okay? So you see this image, and my guess is for many of you, there's a white cube, and it's in front of some black dots, okay? That's your ordinary world, for those of you that see it that way. Here's how I'd like you to think about it. Pie charts, that's, that's cool. Here's how I want you to think about it. I want you to think that you're looking at a white wall. And the white wall has holes in it. And those holes give you view into a dark room. So you look through the, the holes in the wall and there's a dark room. And in the dark room is floating a white cube. So it's like you're looking through Swiss cheese. So this is a white wall. And then through the holes in the wall, there's floating a white cube. Take a second. Okay, so Jackson, the idea is that for one image, the white cube is in front of something. 
And then for this alternative view, the white cube is behind something. So take a second. And if you can't see it right away, that's fine. The ordinary world is a strong thing. You're looking through a white wall. Holes, there's these bunch of holes in, or even paper. You can imagine holding a white piece of paper and there's a bunch of holes in the paper. And you look through the paper, you look through the holes in the paper and there's a white cube in front or behind that piece of paper. Okay, so for those of you that are still having trouble seeing it, right? I mean, there's how strong the ordinary world is. There's how strong your left hemisphere is in keeping you in a certain perspective. And what's required is exercising the other hemisphere. Is it floating? Sure, we can say it's floating. I mean, I can see it that way. Okay, so don't worry if you don't see this right away. Let's do another one really quick. Actually, let's do one more. Okay, what do you see here? What's your first interpretation of this? If somebody asked you, what are you looking at? Uh, you'd say what? Well, maybe you might say something like, I see rue, right? I see a bunch of letters that spell rue. Okay, and that's normal, right? Because we, as we grow up, we know that we read, we learn to see letters and read them. And then, oh, Yutong, okay, so <laughs> that's common. Left hemisphere, read letters. Okay, so Yutong says, wait a minute. This also might mean, are you ready? Are you ready? So do you feel it? Do you feel that pull from the ordinary world, that pull from the dominant hemisphere? It's a very strong pull. So in order to leave behind the ordinary world, it, what might be useful is to first define all the things that we believe to be true of something, right? And think back to your goals. What could define all of the ordinary beliefs you have about how to approach it, how to achieve it, for whatever you're gonna make for yourself, for your projects. Define all the things that you think have to be done to create it, what a good version of that is. If you're creating a song, write down all your assumptions about what a good song is supposed to sound like. Because once you have that picture of the ordinary world, then you can just question and challenge each of those assumptions and see what else you could um, perceive as a way of uh, attaining your goal of finishing your project. Uh, you can challenge all these things by your ordinary world in order to see this differently, right? So that's one way to deal with cognitive flexibility. Just practice, practice letting go of the ordinary world. The second, the second reason why it's difficult to let this go, right, let go of the ordinary world is social conformity. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly go through a couple of studies here. So, you know, there was one famous study um, done at Yale called the Milgram's Obedience to Authority Experiment, right? And I'll, I'll post a video to this so you can see it if you'd like afterwards. But the, the study asked for volunteers to come in and it was advertised as a learning study. So the volunteers would come in to a lab and um, they'd come in in pairs and they would be told that we're trying to figure out learning and do some tests to understand learning better. The two volunteers would pull assignments out of a hat, and the assignments are either to be a teacher or a learner, right? If you're uh, a learner, you get placed into a room, strapped down, tied to an electric shock device, okay? If you're the teacher, you go into another room where you can speak to the learner and help them memorize word pairs. So what does that mean? You might say to them, okay, remember, uh, when I say shoe, I want you to associate that with glue. When I say hat, I want you to associate that with table. When I say dog, I want you to associate that with um, water bottle. Okay? So, eventually, the teacher would then test the student. Okay, so can you tell me which word was paired with uh, shoe? Is it A, table? Is it B, canopy? Is it C, dog? Is it D, glue? And if the learner got it right, they move on to the next question. If the learner got it wrong, the teacher is supposed to press a button that shocks the learner as a sign that it was the wrong answer. So it was kind of advertised as an experiment to see what shocks do for learning. Okay, but that wasn't the study at all, right? The study was to see 
when the teacher would stop pressing the damn button shocking the, the learner. Because every time you shock the learner, the teacher's supposed to increase the voltage. Now you can imagine, oh, by the way, I should tell you that the person that was placed in the learner's room that was receiving the shocks, they weren't receiving the shocks and they weren't even really a volunteer. They actually were part of the study. So nobody's really hurt, but the teacher who was the actual volunteer had no idea. All they knew was that when they pressed a button, they'd shock somebody and then they're supposed to turn up the voltage and they would hear every once in a while screams, right? Ouch, oh, please stop that, that hurts, okay? So the question is, when would, when would you stop? Like, when would you stop shocking somebody? You know, at first, it's similar, you tell yeah. At first, you might have this guilt and, 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 you know, walk out the room and then tell the, you know, the guy running the experiment, oh, man, this, I can't do this. I, I'm hurting this guy. I can't, I, can't, I can't do that anymore. And then the, the person running the experiment would say, you know, it's not going to cause any permanent damage. And it's science. And then the, the teacher would be like, ah, oh, science, right? And then it's, it's the choice. What do you do? What do you do? Do you go back in and continue causing pain because it's science? <laughs> or do you, because this guy in a lab coat says, you know, science, or do you stop? Okay. So let me give you some data on this. Oh, actually, should I give this to you yet? Not yet. Let me ask you. At what point would you stop? Like, uh, how, how far would you go if you were in the teacher's position? Would you, would you stop at the first time somebody said, ouch? Would you stop when it sounded like a scream that you, you've had in the past? Kuma says four taps. Yutong, I keep going. I wouldn't start. I wouldn't do it at all. I wouldn't even shock in the first place. <laughs> when it sounds like they're dying. Okay, depends on your mood. <laughs> okay, let's look at the results. So the range of voltage goes from 15 volts to 450 volts. That's a lot of voltage. Almost nobody stopped before 300 volts. And more than half went all the way to the end when they couldn't turn up the voltage any higher. Now think about that. We have people that are volunteers that just want to do something good. They're volunteering because they want to participate in the experiment and be useful. I mean, these are these are these range from piano teachers to you know other students to you know your mom. These are just people. What was the factor that kept them going? Well, the study seemed to believe that the main factor was that there was this figure, this authority figure. And we felt weird about going against an authority figure. Science, you know, that's it. That's all the guy says. And, 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 you, and most of us kept going because we have this desire to not destroy our social bonds with people, especially people in authority. So can you imagine why it might be hard to leave the ordinary world behind? When we have all of our friends and our parents and our teachers and other people in authority that say, this is kind of what life is about. This is what a good painting is supposed to be like. Can you get a sense for why it might be hard to exercise cognitive flexibility? Okay. One more study. Uh, by the way, a bunch of images showing that human beings are naturally <laughs> and other creatures are naturally social. We want to maintain our membership in our social groups. So it's really hard to, to leave the ordinary world behind because that kind of means leaving behind these other people. One more study, the Solomon Ash conformity experiment. Volunteers again were brought in, put in a line and were shown two images. One image was of a single line and then the other image was of three lines. They were then asked, which of the three lines has the same height as the single line? 
Okay, so what do you guys see there? What's what what's which of the three lines matches the single line? Okay, so it seems pretty obvious to your eye at C, right? And this is exactly what they do in the experiment. You you would ask these volunteers in the line, and they'd say, like we just did here, C, 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 C. It gets to you. You go, okay, C. Next person, C, 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 C. Okay. And you, this would go on for a little bit. Okay, so after several rounds, they get to another set of images. Okay, so here's a single line. Here's a set of three lines. Which line in the set matches the height of the first one? Okay, and the first person says A. And you're like, A? <laughs> what do you mean A? Next person, A. And then A, and then A, and then A, and then it gets to you. And you're like, what in the world is everybody talking about? What do you mean A? What happens to you, you think, when you be placed in that situation and everybody says, A, up to you. What we see in the study is that we have a lot more people now switching their response to A. Can you see how social conformity plays such a strong role in our behaviors and our ideas? Yeah, we become a follower so we can fit in, possibly. But here's the, here's the, the awesome part of this study. The awesome part is that what they noticed is that if we did this again, and first person says A, and then A, and then A, and then some random person says C, and then A, and then A, and then A, and then A, and then it comes to you, even though 90% of everyone before you said A, you are more likely now to say C by a lot because one other person said it too. Which means possibly that if you want to leave the ordinary world behind, if you want to have a creative new career, a creative approach to making money, a creative new business, right? If you want to approach your goals in a creative way, it might be useful to have at least one person that goes, that's not a bad idea. It might be really useful to have one person that goes, you know, I support you in that. And that's all it takes to increase dramatically your ability to exercise cognitive flexibility. Can you get a sense now for what we could do for ourselves possibly to escape this third aspect? It's like questioning my boss at work. <laughs> yeah. So obviously the issue here is that brain wiring and social conformity make it hard for us to really leave the ordinary world behind. So the solutions challenge your assumptions, right? But the first part of that is knowing what your assumptions are, which is what we did in the flower exercise. Challenge your assumptions. Be aware of them and challenge them. What, what's the normal approach to this? What's the assumption I have about how to do this, about what, what it means to, to do this well? And then ask alternatives. Does it have to be this way? Or what other ways could it be? Right? This is how we start to exercise that right hemisphere like we did a second ago. Practice perspective shifting. Now, how do you do that? Well, you might, you might Try to imagine how somebody else from a different culture views this. Somebody else from a different age views this. Somebody else from a, um, from a different time period in history might view this. You might immerse yourself in a diversity of people with a diversity of interests, right? These are all ways to help, that can help us exercise and develop cognitive flexibility.